Hello everyone, um, in today's video we're going to be taking a look at the G1000 with uh, some of the changes that have been made as well as some updates to some of the stuff that has occurred since the last G1000 video way, 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 way back in September. Let's get started. So first things first, uh, the G1000 is a glass cockpit display. It basically replaces all of the traditional instruments that you see inside of an aircraft. There's a bunch of different families of glass cockpits. Uh, this particular one is the G1000, and we'll take a look at the G3000 a little bit later on. Note that even though you have all these sophisticated PFDs and MFDs and beautiful displays, you still have some backup instruments down here, which are completely independent of the instruments that you see up here. In the event, for example, that we had a complete electrical failure, we'll go ahead and simulate that real fast. Let's go ahead and flip everybody off at once. And you can see, I still have my backup instruments. They still operate perfectly fine, so you don't have to worry about situations like that. So uh, like I said, it's always kind of nice to have these. Keep in mind, very, very modern aircraft have a built-in reversion mode, which is going to be what this little red button does right here. Notice I don't have the ability to trigger that mode, which is kind of a bummer because it, 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 it's neat. It's neat. All right, so the GPS, I should say the G1000 is divided into two displays. Your left one is basically going to be your PFD. That's your primary flight display. And your right one is going to be your MFD, or that's your multi-function display. The way I always like to think about it is this is your primary instruments. This is the guy holding a map up so you can see where you are kind of a thing. On top of each one of these displays, you're going to have context sensitive information as well as your audio and frequencies that you're going to be working on. You'll notice, for example, that I have a distance as well as a bearing. And I also on this side have a ground speed, desired track, track, and estimated time on route. Notice there's nothing here because we have not yet dialed in a flight plan or selected a destination for the particular aircraft. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and take a look at the buttons. Both uh, sets of these have a whole little rack of buttons on the left side as well as the right side. These are duplicated. So all the buttons that are on this side are the same as the buttons on this side. However, where it gets a little different is the buttons on the right are actually context sensitive to what's being displayed up on the screen. For example, if I press the menu button over here, I'm going to get this little menu that says PFD setup. If I press menu over here, you're going to get a totally different menu that's going to appear for map setup. I'm going to go ahead and close both of those. We'll get to those in a little while. So the first thing we're going to take a look at is actually uh, one of the most, you know, not so excited versions, which is how to control your radio frequencies. Now on this aircraft, like many aircraft of its size, you have two different navigation radios, and you have two different communication radios. To us, the frequency that you're going to be using is going to be the one at the top. The one that you're going to be ready on standby is going to be the one that is highlighted. If we want to switch between frequencies, all we do is we simply press this double arrow button. Now, if we want to change to the other navigation radio, we simply push in on the big knob that says nav. Speaking of knobs, all knobs have this kind of funky little nature to them. You have a big knob, which is a, what I kind of hold on the back side. I always used to call it big arrow. You have the little knob, which is the knob that sticks out of the big knob. And then a lot of times there is a push button that you can use in this one as well. You'll notice my altitude knob is like that. You'll notice my FMS knob is like that as well. You'll also notice that my course knob is like that. And you'll even see that my CDI knob is like that. The context for those changes depending on what you're trying to do. So let's go ahead and now play with our frequencies first to be comfortable with that. Let's say we want to load up uh, 114.9 or 0 into the left navigation radio, or I should say nav 1. So I'm just going to use the big knob to control the uh, basically the hundreds, and I'm going to use the little knob here to control our kind of tenths place there, hundredth place. So now that my frequency has been selected, I simply press the swap button, which will automatically snap it into the other position. And now, if there is a radio identifier at that, it will actually tell me what, who I am talking to right now, in which case this is a Hotel Foxtrot Delta. This is Hartford VOR station. Now, let's say I want to put a completely different frequency down here. So I'm just going to come down here. I'm going to press the big knob in, so it allows me to select the next frequency. I'm going to go ahead and dial the frequency in. Let's go ahead and call it, uh, we'll do 111.10, which is a nearby ILS. And I'm just going to press the swap button just like that. Now, if we're close enough to actually get the identifier, which we won't be able to because it's being blocked by a mountain right now, it'll actually appear right here. Now, if I want to go back up to the top one, I just press the knob and whoosh, I'm all set. That works the same way as it does over on the communications radios as well. Let's say, for example, we want to use our comm radio to go ahead and listen to what the ADIS is at a nearby airport. So I can come down here. Again, I'm using the big knob in order to control my hundreds. And I'm using the little knob here to go ahead and control my tenths. Now, one thing you're noticing is that I get five thousandths here every time I rotate this knob. On some radios, you're only going to be getting the quarters of the pod, two five kilohertz, if you want to think about it another way. So let's go ahead and uh, dial in a local station. Again, I'm just holding my mouse over this and I'm rolling it. If you need to, you can actually left click and uh, just hold on it. Uh, left clicking and holding on it sometimes is easier to do, but it's going to be a little bit slower. So I'm going all the way down to one five. So I've got 118.15. Now let's go ahead and swap my frequencies real quickly by pressing this button. Notice it's the same regardless of what size 
outside of everything that I'm using at this particular point. Now, again, I'm being blocked by a mountain, so I'm unable to actually detect what that is actually going to be saying as far as sound goes. So let's go ahead and switch back to this. Now, some of you are probably saying, well, wait a minute. What if I want to use my COM2 for that purpose? I'd say, hey, that makes perfect sense. Go ahead and push in this knob here. Go ahead and drag it down to 118.85. And we're just going to go ahead and swig all the way around on the other side and bring ourselves in the correct direction towards it. And now we're good to go. I'm going to go ahead and swap that frequency one more time. Now, something I have to warn you about. Just because you've selected a frequency up here does not mean you're going to receive audio from that frequency. As a matter of fact, you won't unless it is NAV1 or it is COM1. If you want to actually be able to hear or transmit on a particular frequency, you have to come over to our audio panel, which is located here in the middle. The way this works is pretty straightforward. You simply push in the button that you want to transmit on, COM1, COM2. We don't have a COM3. Of course, in an emergency, yeah, you could transmit on both at the same time if you really want to make people crazy. Over on this side is your listening options. So for example, let me say I want to listen to COM2, but I want to transmit on COM1. I select this button for COM1, this two, these two for selecting on COM2. Now let's say I wanted to check the uh, NDB, I should say, the Morse code data from our little Harford VOR. What I could do now, since this is on NAV1, is I could come down here and press the NAV1 audio button, and now I'd be able to hear the Morse code coming through, assuming that I'd have my volume turned up high enough. So if I don't want to listen to that anymore, I can go ahead and shut that off. Notice I have options for ADF, NAV2, as well as auxiliary, which unfortunately I didn't plug my MP3 player in, so we can't listen to that today. So that is going to be it as far as radio tuning. Now, some of you are probably going, well, well, well wait a minute, you forgot an entire set of radio tools. Uh, what about ADF? Well, ADF is handled a little differently on this particular instrument. We're going to come down here to the bottom where it says ADF and DME. We're going to go ahead and left click on that once. It's going to bring us to a tuning little screen here. Now, if you press the button again, it makes it go away. So kind of keep that in mind. Notice it has a volume mode up here in the top right, which is interesting because we can actually tune that volume based on turning this one on and off. Now, let's say we wanted to dial in an ADF station. Now, this is where it's going to get a little trickier. Whenever you have a screen in the bottom right side of the G1000, you're always going to be using this knob for the purposes of talking to it. Generally, the big knob here is going to be for going between pages, and the little knob is going to be to change values. Now, notice this, this is flashing. That means it is selected and you have a cursor ready to go. To disable that flashing, we'd simply push in on the button. But for this particular context, oh, we're not going to worry about it too much. So let's go ahead and I'll go pop down here. We can change what DME mode we're in. We could, of course, we could do nav1 or nav2. Uh, we can leave it as NAV2, for example, and get the DME information from NAV2, even though we're getting it from a different place and while navigating on a different DME. But for us, we're going to go up to the ADF, and we're simply going to use our command here to go ahead and dial it in. Now, for where we are currently, there are no ADF stations nearly close enough to us that we could actually get a value. Notice I'm using the big knob in order to change my position, and I'm using the little knob to change the value. Now, the way this one works is pretty straightforward. We're going to press the Enter key once, and it's going to save the whole value into the standby. And I simply press the Enter key one more time to lock it into our actual ADF radio. So now that it's in there, assuming we'd be able to go ahead and receive that, which we won't because this one's been out of service for the last eight years, um, we would actually be able to go flip on the audio if we wanted to listen to it, or we could actually display it by going up to PFD, selecting bearing 1, until we got ourselves to ADF, which, like I said, we have no data at this time, so we're unable to see that. So go ahead and put the ADF menu away. I just help you make sure that people are kind of aware of that. Go ahead and pop the ADF button, make it go away. Okay, so the next type of radio we're going to be interested in looking at is going to be the trans transponder. So the transponder in this one uh, couldn't be simpler. We simply come down here, which is XPDR, press that button once, and it's going to bring on all of our different options here. Basically, this is going to be the mode. Uh, standby, obviously, is going to be off. On simply is going to be uh, letting everybody know where we are, and ALT is also going to send them the altitude. This is a uh, critical, most universally, you're always going to be on ALT mode. Over on this side, you have control over your code. By pressing the VFR button in the United States, that's going to automatically set your transponder to 1200. If you want to go ahead and change that code, you can press the code button and dial in whatever code that you need to do. Notice the soft keys along the bottom here are linked to the number that is mounted above it. So for example, if my code were uh, 123, four, I just go ahead and type in 1234. Note, if you start typing a code and you made a mistake, and you're like, oh god, what do I do? You can always press the backspace key, or if you want to bail, just press back. And now when we go back to our code, we should be able to go ahead and reset. Oh no, what have I done? You should be able to go, oh, and I've pushed too many buttons. Now what you can do is you can retype it exactly as you needed it to be. 1234, boop, and now we're all set and ready to go. So I can now press back, and that is my new one. Note, if you're asked to ident, yeah, you can always press the ident button right here. This is the quickest and easiest way to do it. 
to get out of this, just go over to the uh, back button and bring us back to our main page. So that's going to take care of it as far as radios. Now, what we're going to take a look at now is uh, some of the display options that we have available on the G1000. So looking along the bottom, um, we have a whole set of soft keys and really, really handy menus. Each one's going to kind of have its own function depending on what the context of the situation is. The first one is uh, controlling this little map down here. This is called our inset map. If I press the soft key that says inset, it's going to give me the ability to turn on top topography. Think of this as terrain. You're going to get these little lines now. You also have the ability to turn on weather, assuming you have any weather visible. Next rad, by the way, is satellite ra or weather. It is not weather radar. So if you had any extreme weather, it would actually start to show up on the screen. You can just press it again to shut it off if you don't need it. And of course, if you want to disable it completely, you can press the off button and get rid of it. So I'm going to turn that one back on. I actually like to have this little radar here. I'm just going to go ahead and press the back button. And we're going to go right back to where we were. You can see got my inset. Everything's looking pretty good. By the way, if you want to change the zoom of this little chart down here, what you do is you come over to range and you can just zoom in and out just like that. Also notice that this particular option gives you the ability to push this button in. And if you do so, you get the world's, world's smallest arrow. Now, instead of using this for zooming, you can now use this arrow to actually drive it around, to actually push yourself off the edge of the map, just like that. Now, if you ever get yourself in a situation where you're like, ah, I can't find where my plane is, you can just push push in on the button, boop, and it snaps you right back to the setting that you had just a few moments ago. Also in the bottom, we have the PFD settings. Uh, going up to the PFD real quick, we have a lot of different options. Uh, this one is brand new. Uh, this is synthetic vision, and we can now finally shut that off. So if I press this button, you'll see this thing that says Syn Terrain. If I click on it, it disables the synthetic terrain. Thank you, my frame rate has returned. If I press it again, boop, and my synthetic terrain returns. This is a super handy button. I'm glad they finally added this back in. I'm going to press back. Next one we have is wind options. Uh, you have three different types of wind options for this particular display. Keep in mind, I'm on the ground, you're not going to get much wind. The first one is option one, which will show you splitting the headwind from the tailwind. Now, what fascinates me is this visible display is showing a wind, even though we're not in the air. I'm not going to think about that. What this basically says is we have a three knot crosswind coming from my right, and we have a one knot headwind hit me in the face. Option two gives us a big old arrow that shows us the direction of the wind as well as the speed of the wind. Again, this would be the magnitude. And option three, my personal favorite, will show you the direction of the wind, and it will also tell you what the speed of the wind is. Now, if you don't want to look at this wind option, you can just press the off button, press back, and away it goes. And the next option is DME. Uh, one thing I want to warn you about DME, though, is if you remember earlier, this is where you're going to be getting your DME source from. If you want to change that, you have to come down to that and actually adjust this before you start going a little nutty uh, down there at the bottom. Go back up to PFD. We'll go to DME. I'll press it, and that'll turn on a DME display. Notice it says it's linked to Nav1. It gives us a frequency. It also gives us the distance away from that DME station, which is 14.6 nautical miles. Now, note, if we use a bearing mode, we're also going to get this. Now, if we want to make this DME go away, I can just come down here and boop, and make it disappear. Bearing 1. Now, you have two different bearing displays in addition to what you have for your big line here, the uh, magenta one. Pressing bearing will bring up this little tiny menu, which will give you the DME at the top, the name of the thing you're getting the bearing from at the bottom, as well as what the source of the bearing is all the way here. It'll also give you this handy dandy, almost like an RMI like line that will point you in the direction of that bearing. So if I press it again, notice it says no data because we don't have anything from Nav2. Press it again, it's going to give you the GPS, which, surprise, there's no GPS data. I'm going to go ahead and press it one more time. It gives us ADF. Like I said, we have no ADF data at all. I'm just going to shut that off. So now on the right side, we have the ability to select my other bearing. So in this case, you know, I've got my heart free right over there. I can press it and get all my different informations. Now, what makes this really cool is you can actually do multiple bearings and the DME all separately, all along the bottom of this display at the same time. Now, I usually say that's a little bit too much information, but some people actually really like doing it that way. So you want to kind of keep that in mind when you're making decisions for how you're going to be operating this aircraft. Let's go put everybody away. The last option here we have is HSI format. That's going to change the shape of this. I'm going to go ahead and push it real quick. We have what they call 360 HSI, which is a more conventional, like almost like a directional gyro. Or you have an ARC, which uh, folks who are big, big fans of airliners, uh, they always fly ARC, which I think is a little silly. I think it's a little easier with 360, but hey, to each of their own. And this gives you the ability to change it to that mode. Personally, I like this mode because like if I'm landing, for example, I can see very logically which direction I need to land. But again, do what works for you. Next, we're going to take a look at the CDI option. CDI changes the navigation data source of this needle right here. If I press it right now, it's going to switch to VOR1. If I press it again, it's going to give me VOR2. Remember, we have no frequencies down here. If I press it again, it's going to go ahead and switch to GPS.
So the important thing about this is whenever you're using the navigation autopilot over here on the left, whatever you set this to is what the data is going to be sent into directly. It's really, really critical. As a matter of fact, if I press nav right now, you're going to notice it's going to give me a roll up at the tippy top because it has no data at all. If I switch this over to VOR one, notice it says VOR up top now. Now, if I were flying a GPS approach, this would say the word GPS to tell me its navigational source is GPS. It's really, really important that you can see the difference between those two. Because again, you don't want to make yourself too, too crazy here. <laughs> now you can see it doing its little happy dance uh, trying to lock onto that. Go away, autopilot. Nobody needs you right now. <laughs> flight director, you can see it's like, give me a nice little off, run for my money here, run for my money, love it. Okay. Okay, so the next thing we're going to take a look at, we already looked at this one a minute ago, was ADF and DME. This basically, like I said, allows you to select the tuning for that. Making our way over here, we have TMR and slash ref. Uh, what this does is this basically enables us to go ahead and uh, display a couple different things. For one, it gives us a timer, and for two, it gives us the ability to add V speeds onto our airspeed strip. So I'm going to go ahead and press this button in to do, uh, select my cursor here. And now I can go ahead and come down to these individual positions. Let's say I want to set my rotate speed. I just come down here and use the little knob in order to set it on. I'm just rolling it forward. And let's say I also want to see my VY speed, which is my best climb. I can come down here and dial this in. Note down here, we can also dial in our minimums if we're doing some kind of an instrument approach. Notice we only have one type of minimum that's barometric, and it'll display that right on the side of the screen here. Let's say our minimum altitude, uh, let's say we're flying to Hartford, for example. I believe that's going to be 340 feet. 340, and now we have our minimums, and you're also going to get this nice little sideways seagull thing basically letting you know. Now, the fun thing is you have this great little timer here. So if I were to set this timer, let's say, for example, I'm going to go ahead and come up to the, again, I've just done one small knob. Well, let's do a two-minute timer. Two minutes, and I'll go over here, and I can actually set this to count it down. Now, notice I can't go off the end of this. To fix that, all you're going to do is push in on this toggle select and call it cursor once. I'm sorry, press the enter key once. Now press toggle selection, and now you can go over and set this down. So now if I were to come over here and press start timer, I just come over here, press the enter accept button, and it starts counting itself down. Now note, there's no special alarm or anything that goes off when this happens. As a matter of fact, unless this is visible on the screen, you're not even going to know that you're getting a timer on this one. To the right of that, you have the nearest option. This is basically going to give, tell you where the nearest airports are currently located. Now, I can again, I can scroll down very, very quickly like this. Uh, again, I'm using the uh, big one right here. And it also gives you all the handy-dandy frequencies and available runways and everything like that, pretty much all down here. Uh, to get rid of this display, of course, you can just press the nearest button and get rid of it. But one of the great things about this display, uh, let's see here, is it gives you the ability to select one of those directly. Uh, let me go ahead and do that again so you can see it. So let's say I want to fly over to, uh, let's see, 7 Bravo 6. That's a bit of a drive for us. Uh, CTO 9. Ooh, that's a really long flight for us. Uh, let's say we'll do, um, we'll do Bradley. So if I highlight one of these, again, I'm using the big wheel here, and press the D with an arrow through it, I can actually create a direct instant course to that particular position. Now, if I wanted to actually make this my flight plan, I could press the Enter key, and it will instantaneously select that near local spot and point us directly at it. So it's a great, 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 great way in an emergency to go ahead and create a flight plan for whatever is closest to you. Moving our way around here, we're going to now take a look at these handy dandy buttons. These buttons are your best friend. Uh, you're going to be using these quite a bit. Whoops, I'm going to press enter again here. So this one right here allows you to select a direct course to something. So I'm going to go ahead and press that real quickly. And you'll notice that uh, whatever your last waypoint selected is will be displayed at the top here. Now, if I want to go up here so I can actually change where our destination is, I can just wheel this around, go up to it again I'm using big knob for menu or page, and just start typing in exactly what I'd like to do. Again, once you wield this once, the uh, little cursor here, you're going to be able to go select between each letter. Let's say we want to go all the way down to the coast here. So we'll say uh, Kilo Golf Oscar November, which is going to be Grot New London. Again, I'm just using the little knob to control the little letters. I'm using the big knob to control the big letters. G-O-N. Perfect. Now, if I want to activate this as my waypoint, I'm going to press the Enter key. It's going to say Activate. I'm going to go ahead and press the Enter key again. Notice we don't have the ability to dial any of these in, which is kind of a shame. Once we're happy with it, though, we're just going to go over to Activate, press the Enter key exactly once, and now you can see my flight plan has now updated itself immediately with that new destination. Again, the Direct 2 is a great, great, great tool. Here's one of the problems, though. If you remember a little while ago, we had changed this so that it was VOR1, which means if we wanted our automatic pilot to fly us there, uh, we've been in a bit of a world of hurt here because it wouldn't be following that new course that our GPS created. If we want to do that, we're going to have to come down here and click on CDI, 
until it says GPS. And now notice it automatically selected a course of one tree five. And of course, it's pointing us directly where we need to. Now, if we want to have some fun here, we can come down here to PFD and we can go ahead and uh, do something silly like this. Now we know exactly how far away we are to our destination. And there's this neat little blue line which will actually tell us how to get here. And again, depending on how you want to set this up, you can go absolutely nuts with that. So making our way across, um, we've got our menu option. Uh, the menu button, by the way, is your best friend. Press menu, it's gonna only give you one choice here, which is a shame. The real G1000 actually has quite a few choices. I'm gonna pick this one right here. I'm gonna press enter. And of course, this gives you the ability to set the brightness. <laughs> so I'm gonna do selection cursor. Notice there's an auto mode. We can set it to manual if we want. Come over here and we can uh, crank this way, way down if we wanna make this a little less uh, burning out your eyeballs. Again, this is gonna take probably a lifetime to get down there, but uh, this is where you would change that particular setting. Whoa, look at the differences in brightness. <laughs> make sure you press the enter key. Uh, when you're done, you're just gonna go over to menu, bop it a few times, and it's gonna go ahead and clean that one out. Whoops. If you ever have this issue where you can't make something go away, you can always hit, hit press and hold the clear to go ahead and get yourself out of it. Or what I always like to do is I press timer ref twice and boop, it's gone. All right, so that's everything on this side. Now we'll take a look at this instrumentation once we get airborne. Over on this side, you have your MFD. Now the MFD, again, this is a multifunction distance device. The purpose of this thing is to give you all sorts of useful information. Up at the top, you've got the RPM of the engine. I can see right now, I'm uh, sitting here at about 930. I'll give it a little bit of gas to get it a little closer to 1,000. We have our gallons per hour. This is fuel burned, oil pressure in the green, oil temperature in the green, exhaust gas temperature. This little teeny tiny one, by the way, just indicates that this is engine one that we're looking at. We have vacuum pressure, which is very, very low. Well, we have our fuel capacity. Obviously, I've been sitting here on the ground for a little while just burning fuel. We also have how many hours are in our engine. We also have our electrical information. Now, of course, if you did something silly like, uh, you know, shut off one of your critical com com components, such as your alternator, you're going to have some issues here. I'll go ahead and flip my alternator back on. Problem solved. Uh, notice we have the same set of radio communication controls up at the tippy top here as well. And we also, of course, have a couple different options down here. Uh, the first one is the DCLTR option. That just simply says the declutter. That's for the purposes of uh, getting rid of extra detail in the chart that we do not need to see. Uh, note, by the way, that when we use our range control here, it's going to be resuming out the entire higher map here as opposed to just a little piece right there. So I'm going to go ahead and press the declutter button a couple times and you're going to see that it kind of goes away no problem. So next what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the map button. Now this is really really cool because they just added this and I think it's wonderful. It brings us to this nice little display that says GPS. If I click on this it gives you the ability to select topo which is going to give us all top not topographical information and it also gives you the next red option which gives you the ability to control the weather. Now some of you are going well that's pretty handy uh, can we get even fancier than this? Uh, the answer is yes. So I'm actually going to go back a couple pages, and I'm going to press Menu. And it's going to bring up this thing up at the tippy top that says Map Setup. I'm going to go ahead and press the Enter key once. Yes! So now what we can actually do is we can select the orientation of the map. To change the orientation of the map, uh, once this is flashing like this, press the Enter key once, and then you can use the big one to go ahead and select it. Remember, the correct answer here is heading up, although people, you're going to use what you're used to. So I'm going to press the Enter key. Now notice the map now faces the direction the aircraft is facing. Another really, really neat option here is the fuel range and reserve. If I press the Enter key on this one, it gives us a range circle, so we know exactly how much fuel we have available. Obviously, since I'm not moving right now, I've got about 37 hours worth of fuel, but I'm not going to get very far, so I'm actually going to shut that off. To make this all go away, of course, I'm just going to press menu twice, and poof, it is gone. So that's going to be the it for as far as setting this particular instrument up. Controlling the zoom, of course, like I said on the other one, we can actually push this button in. We can use our little cursor if we want to go zooming around the screen like this. We can even have a little bit of fun with that. I can, whoa, zoomed in a little bit too much. Hey, would you look at that? I'll go up here to Meriden real quick. That yeah, looks pretty good. Direct. Now notice you have a different menu when you press the direct option here. So I'm not going to stress about this too, too much. I'm actually going to make that one go away. And normally you could use this cursor to go ahead and drive around and get information about things in the chart as well, but not quite. All right. So now with that all out of the way, uh, let's go ahead and get this aircraft uh, nice and airborne. And then I'll go over some of the other options you're going to see in the G1000. All right, we're now on our way. Uh, interestingly enough, as soon as I get airborne, uh, I immediately started getting some calls all the way from here from uh, switching to my other frequency on the other channel. Of course, if I wanted to shut that off, I can just press the COM2 button to make that go away. All right, let's take a look at the actual display now on the PFD. So what you're going to get here is a wide variety of useful information, pretty much all concentrated in one area. Over here on your left is going to be your airspeed. Now, this is not going to be your true airspeed or your ground speed. As a matter of fact, true airspeed is listed down here. Ground speed is actually listed over here. This is going to be your indicated airspeed. Uh, note on 
on this particular speed tape here. We have a green zone, which means the same thing as over on our airspeed indicator down here. We also have the white zone, which is the safe flap operating speed. And you also notice this little Y and this little R. If you remember a little while ago, we went ahead and set these up using our timer and our reference so that we'd be able to see them. Of course, I forgot to stop my timer, so I'll go in here and I'll go ahead and stop that real quick as well. Come in here, it looks pretty good. All right, so now what we're gonna do is so we're just climbing up using our autopilot and heading in our general direction. So over here on this side of things, you're going to see this weird little magenta little sticker here. This is your flight director. This is basically what the GPS is using, I should say, the automatic pilot is using as a reference in order to get to where it's trying to get. Above this, where you see the 5, the 10, and the 15, now this is going to be your pitch. Right now, you can see we're sitting here right at 7.5 degrees, which is kind of like the magical angle. Above your pitch, you're going to have this little needle here, which is going to show your roll. So right now, you can see where the triangles are pointing at the triangles. That means your roll is exactly even. Uh, each one of these lines has a different meaning as far as angle, 5, 10, 15. Obviously, you come all the way out to 30, and of course, anything over here would be a 45 degree roll. Interestingly enough, this little teeny tiny piece right here is going to be your bubble for the purposes of determining slip. For example, if I start pushing on my left rudder, this needle will now start moving itself over to the right because the aircraft is now flying sideways. If I were to bring the uh, rudder back to center, you'll notice this recenters itself and is able to kind of kind of realign itself and everything along those lines. Down below this, on the right, uh, we have ourselves our glide slope information in the event that we were tuned into any sort of a channel that gave us ILS. Normally, when this is triggered, you will also get a separate set of information down here. On the far right side, we have our current altitude. As you can see, as we're kind of working our way upwards here, we're about 2,500 feet. And you can also see our selected altitude at the top. To the right of that, you have your uh, vertical speed. We're doing about 600 feet per minute. And at the top, you have your selected vertical speed. But that would be a discussion for a different day. Below that, we have our current altimeter settings at 2,909 to 2. If we wanted to change this, this is a little tricky. We have the barometric knob right here, and we have our CDI knob above it. Make sure you grab the right one when you go to make your specific instruction changes. Over down here, uh, we have our directional indicator. We took a look at this before. You can see we're heading roughly southeast. We can see we're perfectly on course because our little lower line right here is a perfectly centered. Of course, we have our distance to our destination mounted down here. And we're going to go ahead and level off uh, once we get to that altitude of 3,000 feet. Go ahead and press that knob. Notice as soon as I leveled off, this is going to flash and tell us this is what our selected altitude is. Also note that uh, we have our options down here as far as zoom and everything like that goes. Okay. So now that we've got ourselves a little bit of altitude, we're starting to pick up some speed. Now that we've gotten to a nice safe cruise altitude, now is a good time to go ahead and take a look at some of the other options that we have for making more complicated flight plans with this particular tool. So let's say, for example, um, we wanted to go ahead and uh, you know, take the grand tour here. If I want to take a look at my current flight plan, I simply come down here where the flight plan button is and press it once. Notice you have two flight plan buttons. You have one on that side and you have one on this side. This one is going to give you a preview of the whole flight plan. This one's going to give you a little teeny tiny menu. It does not matter which one of the two flight plans you want to go to war with here. Now, they're exactly going to be the same. Keep in mind, uh, whenever you do a direct two course, you're always going to go ahead. I actually got to reduce my RPM a little bit here, getting a little fast. Whenever you do a direct two, it's always going to generate a fake little waypoint where you started from. And of course, it's going to make you way in that general direction. So I'm going to go ahead and shut off my flight plan option here. I'm going to come here. So when you're working with flight plans, you got to remember it's a little tricky to kind of fits with. So what you're going to do is you're going to want to push your toggle selection cursor in, and then you're going to go ahead and use that in order to select exactly what you want to do. Now, the current leg of your flight plan is going to be this little magenta line. So for example, if I wanted to come down here and create a new leg, I can use the large knob to come down to this new leg. Let's say we wanted to stop by a bridge port. So instead of using the large knob here, I'll use the little knob and just come in here and type it in directly. Now, the nice thing with uh, some aircraft, um, you actually can go in here and manually dial these commands in rather than having to uh, sit here and wheel this little knob. Of course, in the real plane, uh, trying to wheel this little knob is a quite a project uh, whenever you have uh, very, very strong turbulence. And a lot of times these displays have a bezel where you can actually grab it with your finger. All right, uh, KPDR, that's Igor Sikorsky, that's Bridgeport. I'm going to go ahead and press the Enter key. And now you can see we have a brand new waypoint added on to our flight plan. So now if I were to come over here and actually zoom out a little bit, you can see that my flight plan has a new leg. By the way, the leg you're flying on is always going to be magenta. The leg that you have in the future or that you've already passed is going to be white. Now let's say we want to go from BDR and we want to go up to Bradley. You know, why not? I can come down here. I can navigate all the way to the bottom one more time. And I can go ahead and dial again. This is one little knob. And we're going to go say we'll go to BD, and we'll make this a BDL. Enter, enter. And now you can see we're going user, Groton, Bridgeport, 
Bradley. You can see now we have a nice little triangular flight plan here. So that's going to be it as far as using the active flight plan. Now let's say uh, we want to go ahead and get rid of BDR. We come to BDR, we press the clear button normally, and that would go ahead and eliminate it. And you can see, poof, it is gone. And uh, that is no longer one of our appropriate legs here. You can see we're going to take the ground, and then we're going to scoot, scoot over to Bradley. Be very careful with the clear button. You will cause yourself flight plan issues like crazy. And unfortunately, I can't press menu and select um, open flight plan like you can the real one. See, so we have all these like wonderful little options here and context options under the menu screen here. A lot of these are not available at this time, which is kind of a shame, but we'll deal with that. So now let's say I want to go ahead and say, well, you know what? This has been a fun flight, but I really, really would rather just go to this part of my flight plan. If I want to go to a certain part of the flight plan, I can just press the D and now it, notice it gives me the ability to select it. But also notice we've got ourselves a glitch here where it says it's taking us directly to Bridgeport. So you have to be very mindful of the context of what you're doing. Notice you can cancel it by coming in here and hitting cancel. We can also press direct, make it go away. Everything looks fine. So you want to be careful with that because this is not a perfect tool. So again, we'll go ahead and take a look here. I'll go to Bradley Direct. And now notice, because I reselected it, it gives me the ability to do the direct. Press the direct button. Now the aircraft is turning itself, flying in it. Okay, so the next thing we're going to take a look at is how to select an approach into a certain airport. Let's say uh, we want to fly an ILS approach into our current airport that we're flying into. We can actually dial the ILS approach in waypoint by waypoint, but let's keep it simple. So I'm going to come down here with the proc button. Notice, like I said, uh, there's a different context depending on which one of the screens you use. If I press this proc button, you're going to get this one. If I press this proc button, we're going to get this one. It does not matter, they're both connected to each other. So let's go ahead and say I want to select an approach. Um, and we can go ahead and select our approach by coming up to here. I'm just going to use one small knob, and you can pick the one you want. Um, I'm a fan of ILS 6. It's, I don't know, it's just it's the one I always think of whenever I think of this airport. So I'm going to press Enter. Now, if I want to change what transition I'm on, I can just go one small selection cursor. Let's make this one go away. And now I can change my page. Let's say instead of penna, I want to use a penna, because <laughs> that's the only one I have to choose from. If I want to, I can come down here and go ahead and select my minimums. Let's see here. We'll go. Notice we cannot select our minimums in this version. If you want to select your minimums, you have to set it down here. Be careful. Like I said, these are little tiny things you got to watch out for. It will give you this beautiful little sequence at the bottom. Now, this is something you have to watch out for, and you're going to notice this. And that's the fact that our sequence here can be loaded or it can be activated. Loading simply puts it on the end of your flight plan. Activating makes it the new thing. So I'm going to actually press activate here. And you can see it instantaneously activated our handy dandy flight plan. Let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit so you can see it. And it's going to take us right down to Penna, take us right on Honey, and take us right down onto the ground. Obviously, uh, we can't fly this directly on account of the fact that I haven't actually taken the time you know, to set up my current altitude and everything like that. It is worth noting, however, that whenever you set up an ILS approach, your radio system will automatically, usually, if, again, if you set this up in Flight Simulator before you jumped into the actual game itself, will actually load in the ILS frequency in the background so that when you go ahead and lock into it, it'll actually be ready to be swapped automatically. You can see right as we crossed Penna Intersection, I pressed the approach button. As soon as I did that, it automatically selected the correct ILS frequency. It's always critical that when you do do this step that you do double check to make sure that actually worked properly. And you can see it automatically changed my CDI mode to lock two. And you're probably saying, why didn't it do lock one? And the reason it did not do that was because of the fact, if you remember earlier, I had dialed in that ILS frequency into the bottom and it automatically grabbed onto it, which again, is just a testament to how effective the particular tool is. Now, the next thing we want to take a look at is now that we are in an ILS approach, a couple new things have appeared. The first one we have is this little diamond right here, which goes ahead and describes our glide slope, hence the little letter G here. And you can see that slowly makes its way downwards. And of course, once our autopilot grabs onto this piece right here, it'll be ready for its approach. Speaking of approach, I'm going to go down to timer and ref. I'm going to go ahead and take away the things that I do not need here. Oh, press enter. Whoa. And since you have, oh no, it's done the thing. It's done the thing. This will happen from time to time where it uh, does not recognize what item you're actually grabbing onto. Ah, there it goes. Wow, it's giving me all the menus here. <laughs> Unfortunately, sometimes this will happen where um, you're unable to grab it. Just tap this a couple times to disable the selection cursor, and you should be able to go to the item that you want. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and set up my V app here. on the core, and You can pick any of these that you want to use. A lot of times, I pick my glide speed, and so what I do is I just modify this real quick. Come over to here. I turn this one on real fast. I'll go over to the ones we do not need anymore and disable that one. And I'll go down to my VY and I'll disable this one. Our minimums are slightly different for this. I'm actually going to come down here to my minimums. I'm going to go ahead and set them correctly. Uh, they're going to be 400 and 400 feet, right on the nose. Enter key a couple of times, shut up the selection cursor. 
and we are awesome. So now what you're going to see is that coming in for a landing here is we're actually going to have a little carrot here that has this little glide speed on it, which we're going to use as our reference speed for our landing. All right, and we're on glide slope. You can see that it's been captured properly. It's got this little green little diamond. If you have the white diamond here, it means you have not successfully uh, captured it. You can see we're kind of coming right on in here and coming into our nice, safe little landing. Of course, we're getting a little bit of chop because we're importing all these uh, beautiful places. Eh, we're coming up a little fast here, but that's okay. Again, this has been a fairly long video so far, but I did want to be as comprehensive as possible for helping folks out. A big thing with the G1000 is, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, if you need to change your selected heading, you just come over here and I'll go ahead and wheel the knob for heading. If you need to select your selected course, you just come over here and wheel that, but I think we'll save that for a different video. And it seems uh, somebody's built a bunch of houses in the middle of our little rental here, which is... <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, one more of those fun little details that makes it so much fun. All right, hopefully you've enjoyed this video. And like I said, we got a little on the long side, but I thought it'd be a good time to go ahead and give us a nice comprehensive video, kind of explaining all the different features of the uh, G1000. Obviously, more than one aircraft in the simulator do have the G1000 at their disposal, and they all work pretty much the same way. Uh, you're going to have slightly different instrument instrumentation. You might have slightly different displays, uh, depending, depending exactly what you're trying to do. But they all, in general, work about the same way. We're going a little slow here. This is a more of a Cessna 152 approach speed, but that's all right. All right, we'll set this thing on the ground, and we'll call it a day. Looks easy. Go ahead and pull that nose up just a teeny tiny bit. A little bit of fancy feet work here. It's a 172, so you're always playing with the feet. And we are on the ground. All right, folks, enjoy.